The M4 Sherman tank was born out of the urgent need to produce an Allied tank to rival the mighty panzers of the German army. In a triumph of industrial mass production, more Shermans would be made than every type of German tank put together. Using archive film and color reconstructions, Battle Stations tells the story of the Sherman tank, fast and reliable, but with a fundamental weakness. Its armor was no match for the high-velocity German guns the tanks would come up against. Our armor uh, was not even uh, maybe half the thickness of the uh, German tanks. Their guns, uh, the rounds they fired, could just uh, go right through just like butter. The Germans had their own nickname for the Sherman. They called them Ronsons. The advert of the day for the Ronson lighter was one flick and it lights. But the Shermans would make a vital contribution towards the Allied victory in Normandy. And after some of the toughest tank battles of World War II, they led the breakout that destroyed the German army in the West. The tank is not an instrument which is developed to save lives. It's an instrument which is developed to kill. Kill or be killed was the motto, kill or be killed. Tanks were first used by the British in the First World War to break the stalemate of the Western Front, heavy, cumbersome monsters they often broke down. In the interwar years, light tanks became popular because of their speed and mobility. But they had only thin armor and a small caliber gun. In the 1930s, the Germans began to develop heavier tanks with thicker armor and bigger guns along with a whole new theory of mobile mechanized warfare. In May 1940, Hitler launched a blitzkrieg, lightning war, against France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Nine fast-moving panzer divisions supported by infantry broke through in the Ardennes forest, crossed the river Meuse and routed the Allied armies, all within 10 days. Blitzkrieg is historical shorthand for fast mobile operations by tanks and mechanized infantry. Many armies experimented with it, but it was the Germans who brought it to perfection. It's as much psychological as it is physical, making the enemy feel defeated, as well as actually beating him in the field. Meanwhile, in the United States, the army was in a poor state, tiny in numbers and equipped with only a few hundred ancient tanks from World War I. Now, almost every tank in the US arsenal became obsolete overnight. Although still neutral, American industry began speedily to adapt for war, starting the transformation into what would be called the arsenal of democracy. To achieve the high level of tank production needed to catch up, the automobile industry was asked to offer up its management, manpower, and mass production expertise for war production. The president of the Chrysler Corporation, K.T. Keller, responded to the call and mobilized Detroit for war. Keller recommended building a new tank factory. Within a month, quiet Michigan cornfields had become a factory producing tanks, known as the Detroit Arsenal. Soon, streaming off the production line was the M3 medium tank. 
but the army planners wanted a new, better tank to try to match the German panzers. Chrysler staff and military engineers began work on a new engine. A team of designers came up with plans for a tank with a turret-mounted 75mm gun. This meant designing a new heavy turret capable of a 360-degree traverse. This new tank had a similar chassis and mechanical layout as the M3. It had two and a half inch thick steel armor plating. It would weigh 33 tons when fully armed and equipped. Trials of the new tank at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland were a great success. The tank was maneuverable, reliable, and with a top speed of 26 miles per hour, fast. In October 1941, this new tank went into production. Officially, it was known as the M4, but it would most often be called the Sherman. In late 1942, the first Shermans went into service to the British Army as well as the American. I just loved it. The Sherman tank was a 33-ton monster. The first sight of a Sherman, there it was, a huge tank. There's a lot of room in it. A veritable Rolls Royce, really, compared with what we've been used to. Very impressed the way they had the five Chrysler engines, the way they were all made to drive onto one common shaft. Most of the American equipment was much better than ours. They seemed to have the industrial muscle to produce these things. I thought he was going to be able to do the job very well against the enemy. Each Sherman was operated by a crew of five. The driver sat in the left bow. As a driver, uh, the Sherman, you've got an enormous gearbox on, on the right. It's got the same pedals as in most vehicles. It's got an accelerator, got a clutch, it hasn't got a brake. Instead of the steering, you've got two sticks, like joysticks. And by pulling on the right, the tank will then veer to the right. Pulling on the left, it will go to the left. If you pull both together, it stops. Of course, so often you had to drive with your periscope when you are buttoned up. And that wasn't easy, but of course you learned how to do that. When not in combat, the driver and co-driver could also drive by looking out from above the hatch. The rest of the crew worked from the turret. Well, there were three people in the turret, and I would think it was about a diameter of five foot. We were very close to each other, put it that way. And the only thing between the loader and the gunner was the breech of the gun. The gunner didn't have a lot of room because he'd got the gun by the left side, and his sight was all through periscope. The tank commander says where to go, what to do. I always prefer to be have my head out. I couldn't bear looking through these tiny little periscopes. In addition to the main 75mm gun, the Sherman had a .30 caliber machine gun at the front and a .50 caliber anti-aircraft gun on the turret. Shells for the main gun could be either armor-piercing, known as AP, or high-explosive, HE. If the uh, commander saw a target, he'd swing me around. I'd tra traverse onto a target he gave me, you see. He'd say, traverse right and give me the target if it was visible. You could traverse uh, 360 degrees if there wasn't anybody in the way. And our traverse was beautiful. It 
is faster than hell. He'd say action AP or action HE. So the loader would either load an armor piercing shell or a high explosive shell. And then when I got the target, I had to adjust the range. And then you fired and you hoped you hit the target. The Sherman was well suited to fast-moving, offensive armored warfare, but now it had to prove itself in the test of battle. The Sherman tank became home for its crew who had to work and live close together, often for days at a time. We had great camaraderie between members of the crew. Learned to rely on each other. And that gave us this wonderful esprit de corps. You slept together, you ate together, you, you fought together, you know, it's just a unit and uh, you heard all one another's problems from home, you know, if a letter came and there was something wrong, they, they usually used to tell you their problems. And you're trying to learn the other person's job too, because sometimes if something happened, the vehicle was uh, broken down or uh, somebody got uh, injured, wounded, killed, you may have to take over the other person's job. And each evening, the crew would dig in to camp down for the night. If you were lucky, you could dig a hole and run the tank over and sleep underneath it. And you had a sort of communal bed. I mean, you didn't take your clothes off. You took your boots off. And you all five got in together. <laughs> in time, each crew built up an almost intimate relationship with their tank. We named our tanks after our favorite girlfriends. It was something you sort of loved. By 1943, the Detroit Arsenal was in full production. 10,000 workers worked in three shifts, 24 hours a day, six days a week. Each tank required 4,537 separate parts. In total, 11 different factories and hundreds of subcontractors would help manufacture the Sherman tank. By the end of the war, 48,000 Shermans had rolled off the production lines, double the number of all the German tanks produced in the war. The Sherman would become the universal Allied tank of World War II. But the Shermans had a fatal flaw. Their main gun did not have the power of the German panzers, and the Shermans had thinner armor than their German rivals. Small arms fire made virtually no impact on the Sherman's armor. And the crew were well protected from general battlefield fire. But a hit from a German high-velocity gun could easily penetrate the Sherman's thin armor. The crew had only seconds to get out before the fuel or the ammunition went up. If you got hit, you were really in great shape to just go up like a match. You had to get out of there quick as possible. The memory of a Sherman going up still haunts many tank men. The sight of black smoke, I mean really black smoke, with rounds bursting off inside, uh, it is a terrifying sight. It would burn very quickly for, for a very short while. As that died down, the heat generated from it would then start exploding the ammunition stored within it. 
if it, you got a turret hit, a shell could come in and ricochet around inside, which um, and the people within it had nowhere to go, and so that was messy. There was meat, bit of flecks of meat, all the way round the inside of this turret, and. Uh, we didn't look any farther. We, we thought, oh, my, what have we got into? I was only 22 years old, and uh, it was quite exciting and glamorous, I suppose. One always thought, well, it's not going to happen to us. I mean, it was bad luck on those guys, but not going to happen to us. Tank designers traditionally juggled the tank's three main characteristics, mobility, firepower, and protection. Some tanks, like the famous German Tiger, emphasized firepower and protection. In contrast, the Sherman went for mobility. It was very mobile, and it was very good cross-country. British and American planners working on the invasion of Europe realized the need for armor to precede the infantry ashore and to clear the many waiting obstacles. A series of what became known as Hobart's Funnies, after the British general who designed them, were produced. These included swimming tanks with floating skirts around them to go into the beaches in the first wave. When they hit the beach, they threw off the canvas floats. Flail tanks to clear minefields. Bulldozer tanks to clear the path forwards. Most of these tank adaptations proved successful. Others were less reliable. Dawn, 6th of June, 1944. D-Day, the invasion of Europe. The swimming tanks were the first to hit the beaches at H hour minus five minutes to clear the defenses for the infantry. But the seas were rough, and on Omaha Beach, many of the tanks went to the bottom. On the British and Canadian beaches, Hobart's Funnies fared much better and made a decisive contribution to the victory that followed. The Allies had breached Hitler's supposedly impregnable Atlantic Wall. In the days that followed, huge numbers of tanks and men were brought ashore. But once the Germans had properly recovered, a fierce battle ensued known as the Battle of the Hedgerows, after the characteristic feature of the Normandy countryside. Deep, sunken roads, high hedgerows, dense woods and orchards, all proved a problem to the tanks and were ideal for defenders to hide behind. Surprisingly, our intelligence, I don't know why, they, they did not brief us at all about the hedgerows. We had to learn the hard way. I never visualized a hedgerow would be as big as they are. You know, you're looking at a hedgerow maybe at two or three feet high. These were some like eight, 10, 12 feet high. One never knew what you were going to find round behind the next hedgerow or the next corner. The Germans were throwing men and supplies into the battle. Two tough elite SS panzer divisions were sent from the Russian front to confront the Allies around Caen.
By the end of June, about a million men faced each other across the battle lines in Normandy. The British and Canadians kept up the pressure around the city of Caen. But the result was stalemate. The weapon the Allies most feared was the 88mm German anti-aircraft and anti-tank gun. If a German 88 at, say, 500 to 1,000 yards could zero in on a Sherman tank, it, even at that range, he could penetrate without any difficulty. They, they were vastly superior. The, the, the long barrel 75 and the 88 were vastly superior to anything we had. No doubt at all about that. In the killing fields of Normandy, the Shermans would soon face their biggest challenge. Field Marshal Bernard Law Montgomery was the commander of land forces in Normandy. It's hard to be clear exactly what Montgomery expected from Normandy, because after the war, he said that everything had gone exactly according to plan, and in fact, it's clear that it didn't. But he certainly did have a general concept of operations, and that was to use the British around the Norman city of Caen to attract German armor. And this would give the Americans the opportunity to break out on the other side of Normandy in the west. There were going to be several battles to establish the conditions for the breakout from Normandy. Battles to wear down the Germans and to pin down their armor. Hundreds of British Sherman tanks assembled across the Orne River for Monty's big assault on July the 18th, codenamed Goodwood. The assault began with a massive air bombardment at dawn by British and American heavy bombers. It was one of the biggest ground support air raids of the war. The first thing that happened was this enormous air armada came over. One had never seen anything in, or could imagine anything quite like it. Hundreds and hundreds of bombers, not very high could see them all clearly, all the markings. You could almost see the crews in them. And this tremendous carpet bombing. One thought absolutely invincible. One of the lads remarked, oh, well, I'd sooner be this side than on that, where, they, where that lot's going. We can't lose. There'll be nothing left. We should probably be in Germany in two days. This is what we were told. We'll probably be on the way to Germany in a matter of weeks. The aerial bombardment stunned the German defenders. 60-ton Tiger tanks had been thrown into the air like matchboxes. At 8.30 a.m., the British Shermans began to roll forward through the dust and the smoke. For a few miles, they advanced almost without interruption. There was nothing, uh, no resistance. There were some Germans knocking around, uh, but they were shell-shocked very much. Uh, uh, a lot of them were wounded. We stopped and attended to some wounded, put some morphine in them and that sort of thing, and just carried on in fine fettle. We thought, well, this is marvellous. We're just going to sail on forever. After a few hours, the British were in open country. But as the Germans began to recover, the British tanks became easy targets. We got into some open ground, which we had to move across it very fast. Waiting for the British tanks were not only the dreaded 88s, but also well-hidden German panzers, with heavier armor and bigger guns than the Shermans. I 
started looking across at my left, I saw the tank over on the left, and all of a sudden this just erupted into a, a mass of flames. And I can remember, I can remember one of the crew up on the top of the turret covered in, covered in flames. And he, he, he either jumped off or he fell off. Through the periscope, you could see vehicles dropping out. Did the one that was beside you would suddenly slow up and disappear. And um, our losses were quite considerable. Well, it was obvious that things weren't going as well as uh, as well as could be see, it could be expected. It seemed that plumes of smoke were going up from. The, the wide horizon, the, the wide view that you had, everywhere you looked, something was burning. Well, we, we'd advanced uh, about five, six miles, and we finished up in, in this meadow. James Donovan and his crew were ordered to wait for backup tanks to arrive on their left. We sat there, we'd been there at least two hours, saying, well, yeah, I wonder where they got to. We didn't know what was happening. But it was all quiet, so we, we had no great worries. I was looking through the periscope, and I saw two tanks moving up about 100 yards in front of us. You could just see the tops of the tanks as they moved behind the hedge. One of the crew commanders of the tank was combing his hair. Nice blonde hair he had as well. We were that near to see, I could see the colour of his hair. And it was only when he leant forward and put his field out on that I realised it was Germans. They must have seen us at the same moment. Within seconds, the first one of the two German tanks crashed through the hedge. Driver, reverse. Gonna reverse right and our gunner was right on him as we were reversing. Fire! And the, as our gunner fired, I watched, watched the tracer come off the front of the tank and shoot up into the sky, and I thought, oh, good God, what chance have we got with that? His turret came round and lined up with us, and bang, that was it. There was a lot of noise, but it's hard to say what the noise actually was now. Then the order came over the intercom, bail out. Crew, bail out! Bail out! Bail out! The two of us in the front went through the escape hatch in the floor. And the others came out through the turret. crew commander, he said, right, let's run and get away to get a bit of cover. So we had to run to get to the cornfield and dive in the corn until we could sort ourselves out. Several squadrons of British Shermans were almost wiped out. That evening, they counted the cost. I climbed out from the turret and stood on top of the turret and uh, there were nine tanks there. Oh, you, you didn't believe it. I mean, normally you got out and, or in the morning, you looked out on the same view would give you something like 50, 55. But with the arrival of two more British tank divisions, sheer force of numbers enabled the Shermans slowly to win many of their objectives. The trickle of German prisoners captured became a flood. These shattered men were from some of the finest units of the German army. A victory of sorts had been won. 
but it was still far from the hoped-for breakout. By the last week of July 1944, the American First Army had the men and the materials ready and were positioned to break out. On the 25th of July, a new American offensive was launched, Operation Cobra. We heard that there was a big push on and uh, we were told to get ready to go, we were gonna move forward. So we knew that things had started. Large numbers of American troops attacked greatly weakened German forces. The infantry of VII Corps led the offensive. Later that day, the Shermans were ordered into action. The Germans held on for a couple of days, but were no match for the overwhelming numbers of Americans. Dazed by the speed of the advance, the defenders began to surrender in ever greater numbers. Reusing old beach obstacles and welding them onto the front of the Shermans, the tanks now had a new weapon. We went down to the beach and took a lot of the stuff that was in the water and uh, cut it up and used that as material to make those uh, fork things that went on the front of a tank to dig into the hedgerow and help tear it apart. A tank would hit the hedgerow and with some speed, maybe five, ten miles an hour, we will say, and he would just burst through the thing. Carrying the trees and shrubs and everything with him, I saw him used, and uh, they were very effective. The Americans at last broke out into good open countryside, where the Shermans could be used to real advantage. It's a great feeling to get rid of those hedgerows and get out in the open again, where you can maneuver, especially with tanks, and really uh, see that wide open space. The momentum of the advance began to build. This thing has busted wide open, exclaimed one American commander. At the end of July, General Patton was appointed commander of the new US Third Army. His mission, to lead the breakout in the West. He imbued his troops as mean as he seems to have been to them with a sense of, we can. George S. Patton, known as Old Blood and Guts, had a ferocious reputation for taking the offensive, earned in North Africa and Sicily, and he had a ruthless ability to push his men to the limit. We respected him because he demanded the utmost from his troops. Within days, Patton's men were racing into Brittany. His theory was that the enemy is just as exhausted as we are, probably a little more terrified because they're on the run. You realize that once you've got the enemy off balance, it's like a wrestler. Good Lord, move in for the kill, man. As the breakout from Normandy gathered pace, one by one, the French towns fell to the Allies. Saint Malo, Rennes, and then turning east towards Le Mans and Paris. We kept capturing a lot of towns at the breakout, and I can't remember all the towns we went through. Patton's Third Army raced forwards, meeting virtually no opposition. 
the columns of Sherman tanks advancing several miles each day. Well, his strategy was always to get burst through the enemy, just go hell-bent for election, just get behind him and uh, raise all kinds of ruckus in the back country. For the Americans and the British, the crowds began to come out to welcome the conquering heroes. People really uh, welcomed us going through these towns, villages. You know, they threw flowers, they gave us uh, cognac, if they had any. Of course, we, we took it all we could get. <laughs> Sometimes you couldn't move. Roads were jammed with people. So overwhelmed with joy that uh, at last they were liberated. And we had a couple of uh, girls came up and kissed us and uh, put flowers around our neck, you know, really uh, welcomed us as real heroes, which I think we were to them. At last, all was going well for the Allies. But the Germans had one last trick to play. The German commander, Field Marshal Gunther von Kluger, reported, it's a madhouse here. Someone has to tell the Führer that if the Americans get through, they will be out of the woods. Hitler intervened directly to order four armored columns to move from Caen for a counterattack intended to divide the Allied armies in two. It was launched on the night of the 6th of August. A fierce battle ensued. The American line held until reinforcements arrived. With the German line now perilously overextended, Eisenhower ordered Patton to wheel east and advance towards the Loire and Seine rivers, around the rear of the German armor still tied up south of Caen. Eisenhower then ordered Montgomery to attack from the Caen area southwards towards Falaise. Now facing encirclement, the entire German army in Normandy had only one road as a means of escape, eastwards out of the closing net. The Germans could only move by night to avoid constant harassment by the Allied air forces. The Allies now had 19 German divisions trapped in the Falaise pocket. The Germans began to evacuate on the night of the 16th of August. Under continuous bombardment, they managed to get between 20 and 40,000 troops out. Over the next few days, the British, Canadian, Polish and American troops tightened the noose. 50,000 Germans were taken prisoner. Most panzers and mechanized weapons were abandoned. When the Allies closed the gap, the scene inside the Falaise pocket was one of terrible carnage. It's difficult to describe, and really, it's so horrific. Great stretches of roads, fields, Blocked up, covered with knocked out vehicles, dead horses, bodies, absolute carnage, all heading one way, east, and all still and dead. You know, the Germans had a lot of horse-drawn 
equipment, artillery, whatever. Well, you never saw such a carnage of uh, dead horses in your life, and the, the odor was just unbelievable. Ten thousand Germans were counted dead. Kluger, the German general, wrote a letter to Hitler saying that the war was as good as lost and then committed suicide with a potassium cyanide pill. We realized that the German army in France had virtually ceased to exist. I think that was the beginning of the end of the German occupation of France. But the story of the Normandy breakout did not end there. General Patton crossed the River Seine and opened the gateway to Paris. With American tanks advancing across northern France, the German army faced a complete rout. On the 25th of August, 1944, the German garrison in Paris surrendered. The commander there ignored Hitler's order to destroy the city first. Nobly, the Americans paused and allowed free French soldiers to liberate their capital city. The final victory parade in Paris marked a truly immense triumph. The Battle of Normandy was decisive in the war in the West, and it was very important for the war as a whole. About 250,000 Germans were killed or captured in Normandy. But this has to be put in context. At much the same time, another 200,000 Germans were killed or captured by the Russians when they destroyed Army Group Center on the Eastern Front. Either of these would have been a serious defeat in isolation. Put together, they put the German army under the sort of pressure that it couldn't possibly withstand. This was a victory for the men at the front and for the production process at home. Enough Shermans had been produced to win through despite their weaknesses. I think we were very grateful for them. I mean, they were produced in such vast numbers. Goodness knows what we would have done without them. OK, so we don't have anything better than the Sherman tank. But it's American, and we'll do with what we've got. We knew we had the arsenal of democracy. The pride was that uh, Americans could do it. We could manufacture these tanks. And we were told they were good tanks, and they would help us win the war. And that was a good feeling. The Sherman tank had led the breakout and the victory that had crushed the German army in the West. Now the way was opened for an assault against Germany itself. Mainly I was the gunner, so I was responsible for the 75mm, the 30 caliber Browning, and the 0.5 um, anti-aircraft gun, which we ditched because it was a waste of time. <laughs> you had to maintain the gun, obviously clean it, and uh, you had to uh, make sure your ammunition was up to scratch and all those things. Yes, you had to sight it. I mean, you had to be able to estimate ranges, although that was, generally speaking, the commander's responsibility, but sometimes I thought he was wrong and I made my own adjustments. If, if the uh, commander saw a target, he'd swinch, swing me around. I'd tra traverse onto a target he gave me, you see. He'd say, traverse right or traverse less, stop, and give me the target if it was visible. And in the meantime, the loader, he'd say, action AP or action HE. So the loader would either any, load an armor-piercing shell or a high-explosive shell. 
and then when I got the target, I knew what was, I had to adjust the range because there was a different um, propellant in the two shells, you see. Uh, obviously, the AP was a higher velocity than the AG. So you had to know a little bit of technical, had to have a little bit of technical knowledge. And then you fired and you hoped you hit the target. We, I was the troop corporal's gunner then, and um, it was a place called Lo de Bosque. And uh, I think two or, or possibly three of the troop two tanks were hit. And we couldn't understand why we weren't, because we were silhouetted against the flaming Shermans, which are only a few yards from us, in fairness, 20 yards maybe that. <coughs> and the next morning, um, there was nothing happening, nothing on the radio. Everyone was so shocked, I think. The next morning, when we got out, we found out that uh, we had been hit, but it had gone through the metal blanket box at the bottom of the turret, and there was a neat 75 millimeter hole right through Plonk. And uh, the, evidently, the German gunner considered that he'd knocked us out. He'd seen the flash of the hit, and um, he'd traversed elsewhere or withdrawn or something of that sort. But it was, uh, there were some nasty, two of my friends in another tank were killed in that one. One of them, uh, the driver, I must mention him, he was the driver and the cannon of his tank, the troop leader's tank, was depressed over his hatch, so he just didn't get out. Oh, it was very traumatic. Uh, I know that uh, my tank commander, who should be named this, was stiff with fear for the whole night, and I wasn't much better. It was really a traumatic, uh, you know, your friends are in the darn thing, you know they're being incinerated, and uh, or two of them were anyway, and the commander got out with one of his legs hanging off, I think he survived the war, but uh, it's really not nice at all. And that, in my opinion, was the worst moment of all battles. Well, as my vision is very limited, as you know from talking to our friend. He, he had, a, as a commander, he had an all-round vision, whereas we were looking through a little piece of mirror about four and a half inches by one and a half inches and swiveling the thing round. We were just waiting for, well, we could obviously see tanks brewing ahead of us. I remember the rise up to the Borgibus Ridge, Borgibus Ridge um, and there was just smoldering tanks all over the place. Can't understand why we weren't hit again a second time. And we're just waiting for the commander's orders to find a target and load the, get the gun loaded and to fire at it. Didn't find a target. Didn't fire a shot that day. Well, there were cornfields. It was open country, getting up to Borgibus Ridge. And um, this little hammock, Hubert's Folly, was there was a huge hole, I remember, a hole blasted in the church tower. I remember that. And it was, it was a sort of wooded, uh, wooded area. Uh, it seemed that the hamlet or little village was built among woods. Um, and th what I was going to tell you, incidentally, it was still Operation Goodwood, but uh, let that go past. Um, <clears throat> and we actually got the one troop, I think it must have been a composite troop, actually went in behind a 25-pounder barrage and actually took Hubert's Folly. In other words, we were on Borgibus Ridge, and I took a shot at a German half-trap because I went through to the other end. But we were pulled down, and we stayed there overnight with no infantry support at all, and tanks were very, very vulnerable at night, and were pulled back the next day into the north across the railway lines. So my most vivid memory is advancing and taking Hubert's Folly, because that was a beautifully organized little battle. Well, my main impression is of smoke, more than flames. I know uh, another of my good friends was, uh, has no known, well, two of them have no known grave. They're among the first, the squadron leader's tank was one of the first hit and uh, I don't think either of them got out, and they have no known graves. Um, but it was mostly of smoke, quite honestly. I mean, the flames are more obvious at night, as in this first action in Lode de Bosque, but at daytime, you're more conscious of the smoke, black smoke. And unless, of course, they, the ammunition store blows up, in which case, uh, it's almost like smoke, black smoke rings coming out of the thing. I don't know whether a turret has actually been blown off the chassis, chassis but... Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised at that if it was fully loaded with ammunition. Horrible. Really dreadful. They're not built for that sort of country. That's why the, uh, another armoured division, uh, just didn't, which had a very good reputation, just didn't do terribly well in the Bokhaj country. We probably did better than they did. Um, you know, there were sunken roads. And, and then there's one occasion in, a, in Normandy, in a, near a place called Cheux, C-H-E-U-X, however you pronounce that. And um, there was a rather famous German panzer man, I think he was a major, I've forgotten his name, I think it might have been Witter. And a whole squadron, I think it was the 3rd Tank Regiment, 19 tanks, advanced down one of these sunken lanes, and he was up there with the Tiger, and he took out the first one, traversed, took out the last one, and then went down the line and knocked the whole squadron out. So I understand. They were horrible, those things. 
Well, we went to, we had to um, advance. Germans were escaping through the gap, and I think um, our squadron was detailed to crash through a forest. I think it was the Forêt de Gouffern. And um, stop it, plug the gaps, sir, virtually, you see. So we got so far, we were crashing small trees down, all sorts of things, and then someone saw a, a panther tank on our right-hand side, so we withdrew and called up the uh, Typhoon fighter bombers, and they disposed of that. And then we got into a big clearing at dusk, and there were German soldiers running around all over the place with their hands in the air, steel helmets, hands in the air, wanting to surrender. And um, another panther tank came down. Um, my commander saw this thing coming and asked me to traverse to engage it, and I couldn't shift the gun. The turret was jammed. So it was very much a question of driver reverse, or could we say driver reverse, you know, and we just got out of the way. And I don't think the panther saw us, just motored on and probably got out of the uh, trap. But that was the whole point, to plug the gap. And as for the scenes of devastation on the roads in that area, of bloated cows and uh, millions of pounds worth of vehicles, tanks, half tracks, 1,500 ways, motorcycles, weapons, you name it. It was utter devastation, quite depressing. And of course the smell, you can imagine the smell from the dead animals. <coughs> sort of heavy sweet smell, sort of thing that stays in your nostrils for a little while. Well, we, yes, I mean, we were rather happy at this. We realized that the, the German army in France had virtually ceased to exist. Um, it reformed later on, as you know, but uh, I think that was the beginning of the end of the German occupation of France, let's put it that way. And then we uh, chased on across the River Seine and uh, up into Belgium and Holland and Germany later on. Well, I, my driver, I think, was a bit naughty. I think he underfilled the petrol tanks on one occasion because he was getting a bit rasped off with war. He's a nice guy. And uh, we dropped out of action near Amiens, Beauvais, a little uh, town where the R100 or R101 crashed well before the war. We couldn't move. There were no petrol, so the tank commander and troop commander transferred to swap tanks with his, um, or swap commanders. He went to his troop corporal's tank. The troop corporal take us, took us over. And... We were there for days, and uh, we, we really wanted to get on, you know, so I went down into the local village, and there was a team of um, army investigation branch down there, intelligence people, and I asked if we could have petrol and cigarettes and food, and he thought it was, we have deserted, you know, till he, ca he actually came up in a jeep with some jerry cans of petrol and checked the petrol tanks, which were dry. So he gave us the benefit of the doubt and gave us cigarettes and enough ta uh, petrol to fill the tanks, which were several jerry cans. And then we went on and it was rather interesting, the best time I had in the army. We'd, we'd motor on in the general direction and on the, con the, the, the regimental centre line, find the nicest house we could and put ourselves on these people overnight, you see. And one time there was a chateau involved. And um, we eventually caught up with the regiment just near uh, Antwerp. They had, uh, they had overtaken that. But we, in the meantime, had gotten mixed up with the Guards Armoured Division, who had liberated Brussels, you see. So we went in getting all the <laughs> adoration that the Guards Armoured Division should have had, because they didn't know the difference between a black bull on a yellow background and a big eye. And we had a marvellous time there. <laughs> Paris, 1941, a dream of world conquest becoming a reality. Over the Eiffel Tower, over the cities and towns of Europe hangs a pall of fear and death. This could be London, England, or Buenos Aires. It could even be Main Street, USA. Main Street USA has rolled up its sleeves to build and equip and train the best army in the world. This is rehearsal. Men getting to know their machines, learning how to handle them like experts, getting the feel of them and what they can do, learning how to land them on hostile beaches, going over obstacles, rubbing noses in the dirt together. Then maneuvers, the tough job of making the ground team. This is Fortress Europa. Unconquerable, Hitler said. Well, nobody thought it was going to be easy.
D-Day, 1944, and the crucial days that followed. Ships and landing craft, men and tanks, yes. But that wasn't all. Gasoline and food, spare parts and medical supplies. Logistics, it's called. Getting the right number of tanks and men and supplies to the right place at the right time, making it stick. We did make it stick. We started moving inland. They say travel is broadening. Did you ever fight your way through hedgerows? They're about six feet wide and five feet high. Centuries of packing have made them hard as cement. At first, we tried dynamite and tank dozers to make a hole. We got through all right, but we had to funnel like ducks in a shooting gallery. Then a sergeant came up with a great idea, a hedge cutter. When they told General Bradley about it, he drove 60 miles to have a look and slapped top secret on it. Licked the hedgerow country and we pushed on. Tank men are ingenious. They have to be. They have to have a lot of tricks up their sleeves. Here's one. We learned that sandbags packed around a tank will absorb a lot of punishment that can keep a tankman's nerves on edge. We learned a lot of tricks about camouflage so we wouldn't stick out in Jerry's sight. In the beginning, a paint job was supposed to make us hard to see. But it wasn't enough. With a few cut branches, you could break up your telltale silhouette and be pretty hard to spot. With a net, you could blend a whole bivouac area into the scenery so that even low-flying planes won't see you. And if you have a terrain feature or something like a haystack, you can practically disappear. When winter came, we had another problem. But the tankers invented their own whitewash and almost disappeared against the snowy countryside. we kept moving, hitting Jerry deeper and deeper. Even when he wasn't fighting back, he made the going as tough as he could. Like this. You never knew where you'd find mines. Our friends, the British tankmen, invented this one. It's called a flail. It clears all mines from a path wide enough for a tank column to keep going. Snake was another mine eater. Filled with high explosives, they were pushed out into mine infested fields, and when detonated, blew up scores of enemy mines at a time. And always the push 20, 40, and more miles a day. Reconnaissance must be continuous. That's what it says in the book. One day, we found out that we were moving up parallel roads with a Nazi tank column. When they got to the junction, we were ready for them. It was tank against tank, and we blasted them into a tin hat. The crews of these German tanks knew that ours were the most reliable, the most maneuverable, the best manned and the best fought of any tanks in the world. They were at their greatest as a member of a team, infantry and tanks protecting each other. Sometimes you got held up by murderous fire from a blockhouse. Jerry often put them just inside the woods. Even when you could spot them, they might be hard to blast out. Well, burn them out. Maybe you were in the Pacific. Then you'll know how 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit can save American lives. But with one thing and another, it got so the Nazis would rather surrender than fight our tankers. But with or without enemy, it's tough going through the woods. 
time was when a thick woods was supposed to stop armor dead. When you've got the know-how, you'd be surprised where you can go and what you can do with a tank. On the other side of the woods, we hit a town. We must bypass this one. Our rocket launchers help soften them up. Then it's time to move in. Our supply lines have to go through this valley. Jerry knows it. This is the moment when knowing your job pays off. Building to building, door to door, you have to dig them out. They snipe from the buildings and barricade the streets. Slowly, surely, we clean them out and move on. momentum. Our pace becomes terrific for both men and machines. The powerful M26 joined us as we struck deep into the heart of Fortress Europa. Into the great cities of the German Reich itself. Signposts to pass, more miles to cover. But we had begun to know that we had won. Almost suddenly, the end came. People of Europe could look up again. They could cheer and laugh unafraid. Words like freedom, liberty, began to have meaning for them again. the great avenue leading down from the Arch of Triumph had been filled again. Filled with American tanks rolling proudly down to the great square, which is called Concord. Tank mission accomplished.